So this is a real privilege for me because it turns out that one of my heroes is former Governor Terry Sanford, who was also the president of Duke University. I'm a proud graduate of the Sanford School of Public Policy, and as I was studying up on the history of ECS, I learned that he was one of the founding governors that started all this some half century ago. And it's amazing to see some of the quotes that he had back then 50 years ago because you could use probably almost half the things he said during the opening meeting today and they would still be relevant. In fact, one of the things he commented on then was, uh, this was 1965, keep in mind, is that no one fully comprehends the potential of educational television. And four years later, Sesame Street launched, right? So we've always been talking about technology and education, and um, I just want to ground, I want to start by grounding us all in this conversation before I share a whirlwind of important research that Gallup has done over the last year and a half. And I want to start from a question. I want you to think about the best teacher that you've ever had. Gallup actually asked Americans this as one of our daily polling questions a few years ago. And we provided a prompt. We said, now, put that person's name in your head. So I want you to do that right now. Think of the best teacher you've ever had. Put their name in your head. And uh, at the count of three, I'd like you to all say that name out loud if you'll humor me with this. Ready? One, two, three. Alma Blunt. Now then we asked them an open-ended question, which we rarely do on the poll, and we said, what was it that made that person your best teacher? Now this word is probably in your head right now because it was the most commonly used word that Americans used to describe their best teacher. Any guesses on what that word was? I've heard a couple people say it. It's care. I just want to pause on this for a minute, right? We just ask a couple simple questions. How are we measuring care in school today, right? Maybe what schools need is common care. <laughs> so let me, let me transition this to what might be the two most important topics in our country today, education and the economy. Hard to argue that there's two things that we care about and find more precious than those two things, and we're worried about both of them right now for very good reason. And I might suggest to you that we can fix both of them or improve both of them if we think about them as linked systems, which we're really not doing right now. So if we're very honest critics, Think about our K-12 system, our higher ed system, and employers writ large. And the visual that probably best describes them today are castles with moats between them. And what they really ought to be, if we are going to do this right, the better visual might be the Olympic rings. That we have a coherent system where this is all actually working together, dare I say even talking to one another about the needs, etc. right? This is our pipeline of what makes our country great. And we need to figure it out. So you'll recall the famous quip that James Carville made that changed an election about, it's the economy, stupid. I actually think this new phrase is gonna be something that guides leaders for the next decade. It's the edge economy, stupid. Let me share with you what I mean. So first, I would submit that right now, we're looking at our educational system through a deficit-based lens. And the outcome measures we're using that we're thinking of as ultimate outcomes are just intermediate measures at best. We even use words like reform to talk about the innovators in this work, right? Education reformers. If you look up that word in the dictionary, it's a pretty ugly word. How many of you want to be reformed? Raise your hand very high, please. We use the term remedial to describe courses that we put students in. How many of you want to be part of a remedial course? Maybe an accelerator, but not remediation. So I think we need to shift our thinking from a deficit-based approach where we're constantly focused on what's wrong, what students don't know, how ineffective teachers are, and we need to think about what we're really trying to measure here. Are these really ultimate outcomes? It's important to graduate, but if you graduate and don't get a good job, is that what we're looking for? 
This is what we know about student engagement. So the Gallup student poll measured more than 650,000 students in fifth through 12th grade this year. By the way, this is a poll that every school in America can take advantage of for free in October. If your districts aren't using it, they can sign up, register, and take the poll. It measures student hope, engagement, and well-being. And this is what we know about student engagement in school. The longer they're in school, the less engaged they are. In elementary school, 76% of students are engaged. By middle school, it drops to 61%. In high school, 44%. The only year that we see this plateau is between 10th and 11th grade. Any idea why? It's a year most students drop out. If we were doing this right, this line would be going in the opposite direction. And we also know that Americans are losing confidence. So since Governor Sanford opened this commission up in 1965, confidence in education for Americans has dropped in half. And it's probably not getting better anytime soon if we don't fix some of these challenges that we have in front of us. I think a lot of us appreciate this concept, but it's worth noting, right, that at the time in history where our rate of knowledge is expanding exponentially, the cost of knowledge is actually trending towards free. And this is something that you're going to hear about tomorrow. And Khan Academy is an example, Coursera, Wikipedia, even Google, right? Note that I didn't say the cost of a degree is trending towards zero. That's going in the opposite direction. But here's what the implications of this are, that we're never going to compete again on simply what we know. It's going to be how we apply that knowledge that's going to distinguish our kids and our country. This is a trouble one. We asked virtually the same question of three different audiences and three different studies we did this year. We asked chief academic officers of colleges and universities whether they felt confident that they were preparing students for success in the world of work. 96% are somewhat or very confident that they're doing that well. Well, then we asked Americans a question. Do you think college graduates are well prepared for success in the workplace? They have a different opinion than provosts do. 14% strongly agree. And then we asked business leaders, C-level executives in companies from around the country, and it's even worse. Only 11% strongly agree that the college graduates they see have the skills and experience that they need. Now, when you look at this, I don't know how you explain it. It's just impossible for me to get over the fact that we have such a broken linkage between these things. And I don't know where the truth lies, but even if it's somewhere in the middle, it's still something that we shouldn't tolerate. Here's an interesting one. We're always worried about how the country's doing on international standardized test scores. And then there's 32 countries where there's overlapping measures on PISA scores and what's called the Global Entrepreneurship Measure, GEM. And it turns out there's a negative correlation. So I was just on a panel last year with the ambassador from Singapore, and he was there to talk about how Singapore has become number one in the world in standardized testing. We were all waiting to hear what the model was. And the first thing out of his mouth was about how they're worried about entrepreneurial energy in their country. So it's not unimportant for us to strive to be number one on these tests, but should we be as concerned as we are, and should this be one of the only ways that we think about measuring what we're doing? Definitely not. It turns out that when we look at educational outcomes, we're using only a handful of measures to get at this. On the left-hand side are inputs, which, by the way, determine a large percentage of the rankings that we use to rank colleges and universities in this country. It's mainly based on inputs, right? The selectivity of these institutions, the SAT scores or ACT scores or GPA of students on the incoming side of it. No one's really measuring the learning growth of those students from freshman to senior year. We honestly have no idea from that perspective which are the greatest colleges and universities in this country. And on the outcome side, we still are using measures like graduation rates, important measures, believe me. These are all necessary but horribly insufficient if we look at them in whole. GPA, for example, is one I'm really challenged by because in the last 30 years, GPA has gone up 1.1 points. So if you graduated 30 years ago with a 2.3, I'd like to congratulate you. It's really a 3.4. There's a lot of you who are laughing about that, so it tells me what your GPA was and how old you are. So then we throw a little wrinkle into this, and I'll give you a finding that's now in 23 published studies, that hope is actually a stronger predictor of high school and college completion than SAT scores, ACT scores, and high school GPA. Think about that. Because the question I always get is, did you say hope? It's usually someone in the back of the room, and you spell it out, and you say, yeah, it's one's ideas and energy for the future. By the way, we can, we can reliably measure 
a construct like hope, just like we can grit and a number of other things that we thought we couldn't measure. So here's an important question. What really is the ultimate outcome of education? If we just step back and ask that, is it a high GPA and a high test score and a graduation rate? Well, those are important intermediate measures, but I would argue there's something way beyond that, something we all talk about if we're asked the question and answer it honestly. We talk about great lives. We talk about great careers. We talk about knowledge in the service of society. We talk about a lot of profound things, yet we're barely measuring any of it. And Gallup has some interesting data to weigh in on this because there's two things we've been measuring more and longer than anybody in the world. One is what we call well-being. This actually started in the 1930s with George Gallup. He was obsessed with trying to quantify what he called a life well-lived. So we started studies to try to look at this. And it really kind of went on turbocharge when we launched the World Poll. So as of 2006, we've been statistically sampling 98% of the world's population, measuring well-being. We're also measuring it every day in the United States through the Daily Poll. And here's what I want to tell you. These are not just soft measures that sound like nice things for us to keep account of. They're actually very hard predictors of key performance indicators. Let me just give you one example. Healthcare cost burden. Maybe bankrupting our country right now. $2.7 trillion healthcare tab. If you have an employee who's thriving in all five elements of well-being as Gallup measures them, they cost a third of the healthcare cost burden of an employee who's not thriving in any. And we don't have to get employees thriving in all five elements, which is a very high bar. One element, two, three, four, all of those drop healthcare cost burden incrementally. We also measure what we call workplace engagement. And again, it sounds like a nice thing to measure, engagement. The reason why we really care about it is that we've found a handful of items that are predictive of all kinds of key performance indicators in an organization. I'll point out a couple of the interesting ones that you say you have someone who cares about your development. There's that funny word care showing up in the workplace. It's already showed up for you and the person that you thought of as your best teacher. We also know it's important for people to say that at some point in the day they get to do what they're best at every day. This is a true statement for students as well. And to know that there's someone who encourages your development. Now, this is a common thread that I want to pull through all of our research, but here's why workplace engagement matters. The difference between being engaged and not, lower absenteeism, turnover, higher profit, revenue, whatever it is we've tested this against. These are really hard measures that we ought to be paying attention to in all of our organizations. And back to that deficit-based approach, that deficit-based lens that we take when thinking about kids in school and teachers, here's something from the workplace that will get you. Let me just explain what this means real quick. So we have engaged and actively disengaged. Engaged are the employees that are driving our economy forward. They show up with energy. They have new ideas. If you tell them to clock in at 8, they're there at 7.30, right? You get the idea. Actively disengaged, here's, it's a weird term. This is the best way to describe it. Has anybody ever seen the movie Office Space? These people are so miserable that they take their misery with them everywhere they go. So if you have a really great idea, I'll come and sit with you until that idea goes away. <laughs> That's what we mean by an actively disengaged employee. So here's the importance of a strengths-based approach. If you have a manager who ignores you entirely, there's virtually no chance that you're engaged as an employee. Here's a huge improvement. If you have a manager who does nothing but harp on your weaknesses, give you critical feedback about what you can do better, that is a huge improvement over being ignored. Engagement goes through the roof relative to being ignored, but you can see that there's still a large portion who are actively disengaged. If you have a manager who focuses on what you do best and tries to get you into a place where in your role you do that at least once every day, not all day long, but you have to be able to say that at least once a day you have a chance to do what you're best at, there's virtually no chance that you're actively disengaged. This is how important this mindset is. So let me share with you two massive reports we've done in the last 90 days. The first one from the State of America's schools. And in it, we found that only about 33% of our students are what we call success ready, that they had high scores on hope, engagement, and well-being. So like our standardized testing scores, we've got some work to do on these measures as well. It turns out, though, there's some interesting data from a study we did relative to the entrepreneurial energy in our schools. Almost half of all of our students in fifth through 12th grade say they plan to start their own business someday. Think of the entrepreneurial energy that's bottled up in our schools and in our kids. Here's the trick. They're not getting any practice reps at this because less than 5% are currently earned turning with a business. 
Only about 3% are currently running their own business, whether that be a lemonade stand or whatever. And only 17% have worked an hour or more in the last week. Here's a news flash. Schools, colleges, and universities generally don't have internships and jobs to offer, aside from maybe a work-study opportunity. If we're going to improve this, it has to be because employers of all sizes and types come to the aid of local schools and universities and start to think about how they can offer more of these opportunities for internships, whether they're paid or unpaid, it doesn't matter. Here's the most disappointing news I can share with you today. Teachers of all professions in the United States are the least likely to say that their opinion at work counts. They're also the least likely of all professions behind truck drivers, coal miners, and everybody else on saying their supervisor creates an open and trusting environment. What the hell are we doing, America? If we don't fix teacher engagement in schools, how are we ever going to move the needle on student engagement? I mean, we should all be ashamed of ourselves for letting this happen. I'm ashamed, right? We all should feel that in this room, because all of us have an opportunity to own answers to this problem. It's not that difficult. It doesn't cost billions of dollars to fix this. I'm not going to say it's easy to fix, but it's not an expensive fix. So in schools that have super high teacher engagement, it's what their leaders do. It's what the principals do differently that makes them stand out. In these schools, they have principals in the last seven days have recognized them for work that they've done. In the last six months, they've talked to them about the progress they've made and that they make them feel their opinion at work counts. This is a change in what we value. It's a change in how we lead. It's not a change in how many billions of dollars we have to pump into the system for new buildings and other things that may not really move the needle on engagement. We found a needle in the haystack in our student engagement data. This is a 30x finding. It's special when you find a 3 or 4x finding. This is 30x. If you're a student who says strongly agree to two questions, you're 30 times more engaged. That is that you believe your school is focused on the bu building the strengths of each student and that you have a teacher who makes you excited about the future. I know there's a lot of state teachers of the year in the room. You can't imagine how powerful your impact is. You really can't. A teacher who makes you excited about the future. If we do that, we can change everything about engagement in school. It turns out that what we've learned about the kinds of curriculum, the things that we teach, how we teach matters a lot. And the things that work in school as it relates to predicting success in young Americans, this was a study of 18 to 35 year olds, it looks like real work. There were two items that sorted in this study on being more likely to be successful as a, as a young professional in the United States. And that was that you said that you worked on a long-term project that took more than a few classes to complete, and that you applied what you were learning to solve a real problem in your community or the world. Think about how simple that is. Nothing else sorted, really, in this study. Those two things just popped out. If you said strongly agree to those two things, twice as likely to be successful as a young professional. And here's an interesting one. It turns out that if you also said that your teachers cared about your problems and feelings, and encouraged your hopes and dreams, you are more likely to have experienced those two things. So again, this idea of care and support, these fluffy little words that we think don't matter that much, matter an awful lot. So let's just turn to higher education real quick. Here's the good news. Demand for higher education is still super high in America. 95% of Americans agree that education beyond high school is important. And this is in a country where the majority still do not have a college degree. We also know that a whole bunch of Americans, adult Americans, are thinking about going back for a certificate or degree. That's great news. But here's what's in, in question. Quality is in question. Because when we ask Americans to grade the US higher ed system relative to others around the world or compared to itself in the past, the numbers don't look so good. And this is crazy, because if you look at international rankings of institutions of higher ed, the US has 90% of them on those lists. But Americans aren't feeling it. And only 29% strongly agree that traditional colleges and universities provide a quality degree. Here's a point that none of us can miss. No one is going to college anymore to get a degree. What are they going to college for?
to get a good job. And if we lose sight of that fact, we're in big trouble. Because if you ask a representative population of Americans, that's the number one reason they say someone should get a college degree. If you ask current college freshmen, as UCLA has done in their SERP survey, the number one reason is to get a good job. If you ask parents of fifth through 12th graders, it's the same. It doesn't matter who we ask. And this was a scary one. If we ask parents of fifth through, fifth through 12th graders to tell us what they think is the best path to a good job for their child, the number one answer is career and technical training. Number two comes in at no college at all, followed by a liberal arts degree. We will find other pathways to good jobs if our educational system doesn't figure out how to improve on this. So let me wrap up with findings we've learned from the largest study of college graduates in US history. This was a study we just reported about 60 days ago. 30,000 college graduates in the United States. And we were measuring the degree to which they were engaged in their work, the measures I described briefly a few minutes ago, and thriving in their well-being. Yeah, we looked at how much money they make, what their salary was. We've already known, of course, that college graduates make more money over their lifetime than those without a college degree. In fact, that's one of the only real findings that we have as a country on the long-term benefits of college. Here's the trick, though. I don't know many college and universities whose mission statement is about to increase the lifetime earnings of their graduates. I still haven't found one. They talk about other things. They talk about career well-being, and having happy, successful lives. So this is what we measured in this study, and here's what we learned. First of all, this was the first surprise, that it makes no difference by type of institution where you went. Public versus private, not a single percentage point difference in the likelihood that you're engaged in your work or thriving in your well-being. We cut it a little further. That's a pretty broad distinction. We looked at highly selective institutions according to Carnegie classification data. No difference between highly selective and everybody else. We looked at top 100 ranked schools in US News and World Report. No difference between them and everybody else. What we did learn, however, is that how you do college makes a huge difference. So if you were a college graduate who was what we called emotionally supported, it doubled your odds of being engaged in work, and you were three times as likely to be thriving in your well-being. And it was measured by these three statements. So ask yourselves these questions right now. You strongly agree to each of these three statements. You had at least one professor who made you excited about learning, that the professors at your alma mater cared about you as a person, and that you had a mentor who encouraged your hopes and dreams. How many of you say strongly agree to all three of those questions? Raise your hand high. Do you know what percentage of college graduates in the US strongly agree to all three? 14%. Fourteen percent. By the way, about half the room here raised your hand. You got lucky. You took advantage of your education, perhaps in different ways than others didn't. We also found three other items about deep learning and experiential experiences that sorted. These also doubled your odds of being engaged in work. They had a slight relationship with well-being, not nearly as powerful as the emotional support items. But they were the following, that you worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete. This sounds similar to the findings I just shared with you a few slides ago. That you had a job or an internship where you applied what you were learning, and that you were extremely involved in extracurricular activity. How many say strongly agreed all three of these? Raise your hands. About 30% of the audience. Guess what percent of college graduates in the US strongly agreed all three? 6%. We have to be doing a better job. When we do this right, it has a profound effect on our life and career trajectory. But it's happening for so few of us that it's almost embarrassing. So let me just wrap up with what I think we need to do. We need to stop focusing all of our time and attention on what's wrong and start figuring out what's strong with students and with our teachers and with our schools. We need to figure out how we value more pathways to success, because I'll tell you right now, a kid with entrepreneurial energy in our classrooms today, we're probably more likely to diagnose that kid with an attention, attention deficit disorder than we are to think of them as the next Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm only half joking about this, right? Because I wonder to what degree we are thinking about that as a talent and figuring out how we embrace that and support that in our schools. We're real good at figuring out IQ. We're real good at figuring out athletic talent. There are so many talents in this country. We need to make sure we're paying attention to all of them and embracing them. 
We need to figure out how we get out of this mode where almost 100% of how we evaluate students and teachers and principals is based on standardized test scores. They're important, they're necessary, but we've got all of our eggs in that basket. And I can tell you right now, we've probably done a better job of building accountability systems around schools than figuring out how to build engagement systems within them. That's the change that we need to make real fast. And I think this becomes real simple. That if you say, I want to improve student engagement, there's only really one answer to that. There's not even a close second place. It's to improve the engagement of teachers. And then if you want to know what's the number one driver of that, it's a simple answer too. It's a great principal or college president that drives that forward. When I was a Duke student, I never had the opportunity to meet Terry Sanford. He actually passed away my sophomore year. One of my big regrets. They didn't call him President Sanford there. They called him Uncle Terry because he was famous for walking around campus. He knew everybody's name. He would say hello. He would hang out with the students. This was a guy who cared and mentored in spades. And he's famous for it to this day. I mean, it still is part of the ethos at Duke. I tell you, there's districts that have figured this out too. Montgomery County and Josh Starr. In addition to all the other things they're measuring, they're measuring the student engagement of all their students who show up in their buildings and the teacher and staff engagement of everybody who reports that district from bus drivers to lunch ladies and everybody in between. And then they're working with principals in each of those buildings to think thoughtfully about how they can move the needle on those measures. We can do this. It doesn't cost us an arm and a leg to figure it out. So if I summarize very briefly, what I want everybody to try to commit themselves to do is to try to help us build the world's greatest edge economy. And let me just tell you what it might look like. It might look like states focused on engagement systems, not just accountability systems. It might mean a superintendent having a goal to become the Silicon Valley of great principles for their district. It means schools that are focused on what's strong about students and making sure that they have someone who encourages their development and makes them excited about the future and cares about them as a person. It might mean all of us, even adults, learning and doing every day because it's the application of that that's going to matter so much. It might mean 100% of our students having an internship or some work experience because 100% of our employers pitch in to make it happen. It might also mean that mentor duty becomes the new jury duty. And I hope more than anything, it becomes the case where teaching becomes the most valued profession in America. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.